The next question comes from Crypto Herbalist, and Crypto Herbalist asks, what are your thoughts on large companies like Facebook that are getting into the space? Do you consider them a threat to decentralized platforms? Well, you know, David lives in the Valley. So, uh, you know, uh, David, you should probably take your Valley-esque uh, perspective. Uh, you know, bring it to all of us. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm not positive I have a Valley-esque perspective, but I'll offer mine. Um, <laughs> I think... I, I think um, Rising tide raises all boats at the at the moment in in crypto and the decentralized app platforms. Um, uh, more exposure. There, there's still a, a large number of people kind of waiting to see, deciding if this if, if crypto in general has credibility and is going to be a thing. Uh, we all we all believe it's uh, going to be a big part of the future, but many people are still waiting. And so those kind of projects, they they add to that. You know, when you think about a large company and there many many companies now are experimenting with small blockchain projects, sort of proof of concepts. And and they want to learn how it could affect their business. But most of them are kind of waiting. They want to see multiple viable, sort of a, a large mission critical enterprise class platforms that they could build on so that not even just one, they want multiple so that they can they can see this as a more mature industry. And they want the credibility of, uh, of the onboarding and offboarding platforms that something like a Facebook or a federally supported Currency like like uh, uh, a stable coin like like Charles was mentioning. So I see the I see these things as helpful, um, and uh, and they they drive the industry forward. Yeah. So basically, they want to watch other people fail and then steal your developers. No, I'm just kidding. That's, a, that's, that's what they do sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a Silicon Valley move to me. That sounds like something that that would happen. Sorry. What did Aqua hire? <laughs> you know, and actually, it's kind of interesting that Silicon Valley isn't the leader of the cryptocurrency industry. They had an opportunity, but they didn't take it too seriously. And most of the major companies and most of the major innovation for cryptocurrency is actually done outside of Silicon Valley. For example, if you just look in the North American continent, uh, the two big hubs are Toronto and New York. Um, uh, not for, for, there are some prominent California-based companies like uh, Coinbase and Circle and so forth. But, I mean, consensus is twice as large as both of them combined. And then Ethereum was created out of Toronto. Uh, and there's tons of great projects like Polymath and others uh, in those domains. And most of the good entrepreneurs that I, I work with are actually in Asia or they're in Europe. Uh, so there is a bit of catch-up that the Valley has to do. And, Furthermore, these large tech companies, usually the reason why they haven't entered or been residents to enter our space has come from regulatory reasons. It's just not clear what the regulations are going to look like, not just today, but the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Remember, when you're Facebook, you don't just ask the question of what is the Securities Exchange Commission going to do? You're building a decision matrix where you're saying if Trump loses the 2020 election and this particular candidate wins, uh, what type of person would they put in charge and what would financial regulation look like and how will that impact and then you you make them contingent like what what if the european union does this and how will this work and if you're facebook you're in 100 different jurisdictions uh just today i, I read that there's potential law being passed in india uh, that could ban the use of cryptocurrencies and if you use them you get 10 years in jail whether that passes or not that fits into your calculus because you'd be in compliance in the united states but then you would be out of compliance in India. So then you have to figure out how do you localize these types of things? And, you know, does it make business sense? So they have a lot more to lose. And they're regulated companies. They're public companies. They're subject to Sarbanes-Oxley. They're, they're subject to all kinds of reporting requirements that I'm not subject to. And so that, by definition, means they have to move in a more methodical way. And in many cases, that means that they'll build an internal research and development group They'll come up with all kinds of crazy ideas that are magical, and they have a lot of great engineers, so they can build things on par with what we can build. But then those things tend to just sit on the shelf until eventually they say, okay, we're fine. Let's go do this. And now, there are some bellwethers that tell you that companies are getting more comfortable. Microsoft deploying an identity management system on Bitcoin is a huge bellwether. That's, that's a big step forward. It legitimizes a lot in our space. Uh, Ernst & Young and Deloitte and PwC, the auditors actually building audit solutions with blockchain technology. 
or for cryptocurrencies is another big step forward. It means that tax compliance and these types of things are becoming more resolved matters. And then finally, of course, Facebook announcing it's going to launch its own token. That means that they did the calculus within that company that uh, that this makes sense. And what that means is that competitive pressures will now force Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and other entities into the space within the next 24 to 36 months. And so that will become a community best practice. And so that's the real competition because you're gonna have wallets built right into Microsoft Windows or right into Google. Uh, and they might have a cloud wallet in Gmail or something like that. And wow, now they have 2 billion users uh, and they have very sophisticated tools to make these things great and great user experiences. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun to compete with. This is why, for example, we've chosen a pan-African and a pan-Asian uh, view uh, because, you know, we're not really competing much with IBM or Microsoft or Deloitte or these other guys in those jurisdictions. Um, they won't touch those markets. So we can end up getting hundreds of millions or billions of users despite the fact that Facebook can have 2 billion users. And that's a unique USP to Cardano. Meanwhile, the EOSs of the world and the Ethereums of the world are desperately trying to absorb as many users as possible to try to get to a scale where they, they, they will stand a chance to survive that coming tsunami wave of incumbents that will, uh, that will be quite difficult to compete against. In many cases, we'll enjoy unfair regulatory advantages, unfair banking advantages, or, or in some cases, be able to alter the law to make their products basically the only products that can function, whereas these emergent upstart cryptocurrencies may be washed out. Meanwhile, that's not going to happen in Ethiopia or in Mongolia or in Uganda or these other core markets that we're exploring. We feel that we'll be first to market. and The demographics actually line up quite nicely for them to go along with us. Uh, so, you know, this, it's just fun to watch, though. That's what makes these things exciting. I mean, if you pick any decade of technology, whether that be 1990, 2000, 2010, it's damn near impossible to predict who's going to be on top and who's going to be the most relevant company. If you took somebody from 1995 and you said, prediction, what is the most sexy, relevant technology and company for 2005? Uh, the 1995 person would probably say Microsoft. And then you go to 2005, they'd probably say Google. And if you go to 2015, they'd probably say Facebook or something like that, you know, or Tesla. You know, what is it going to be in 2025? Who knows? Maybe it's an AR company. Maybe it's Neuralace. You know, BCI is like the big thing. Uh, so uh, this this creative destruction tends to open up opportunity for everybody. But you do have to think in trends. You do have to think in markets. And you do have to understand that at the end of the day, we tend to move at the speed of regulators. Uh, when I joined Polymath as an advisor, it was astounding to me the requirements, the business requirements, the regulatory requirements that go into their product development. I mean, like literally, they have to think about securities laws in dozens of countries and think really carefully about uh, basically, how do we keep all these people happy and, and and deal with imaginary boogeymen that could come five years later and retroactively say everything that's been built is somehow out of compliance and therefore no one can use it? Uh, so when your thought process is along those lines, you're really not thinking much about moving fast and breaking things. You're thinking a lot more about how do you play the, the regulatory game? And I'd much rather play that in jurisdictions that are greenfield markets and I can have influence over regulation or even change laws than play it in places where somebody can put a hundred million dollars into lobbyists and then suddenly make my entire business model illegal as we saw what happened with the payment service providers back in the 90s and the 2000s and so forth and the eagle guys went to jail as a result 